All right, this is block eight, notes number three, growing apart. Uh, so we took a good look, a good long look at the um, the North and the South and their politics and their economics and their social systems. Um, so the Compromise of 1850 uh, is put into effect. And the first thing that we need to talk about when it concerns us, the section splitting apart uh, is the Fugitive Slave Law. So that's number one, the Fugitive Slave Law. The Fugitive Slave Law was the biggest victory that the South got from the Compromise of 1850. Uh, there had been a Fugitive Slave Law in the United States from the very beginning, from uh, you know the first Congress, that it was the responsibility and duty of all people in the United States to um, assist slave owners in getting their property back if they tried to run away. Um, by the 1820s and 30s, um, the Underground Railroad, which you know you all I assume know, the Underground Railroad is the kind of, the, the network that helped escaped slaves reach the North and eventually Canada, uh, was kind of up and running. It was never a huge thing, but every year, dozens and hundreds of slaves, you know, especially from the northern parts of the South, escaped and uh, got their way back to freedom. And that angered the South. So the big thing they were pressing for was a new and more powerful fugitive slave law. So the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 stated that federal commissioners were appointed in every city and county with the authority to issue warrants, summon posses. Now, in the time before police forces, if you needed some kind of legal force, you got a posse together. You kind of got all your friends together and said, all right, let's go arrest this guy. Uh, so these federal commissioners had the power to form posses, issue warrants, and compel citizens to aid in the capture of runaway slaves. That they could knock on your door and say, come out, you're in the posse, and we're going to go capture this slave. The commissioners were paid based on how many people they found. And they got a large... And so when they found somebody, hey, look, there's a black guy! Um... They got, they got paid more if they determined that they were runaway slaves uh, than if they determined they were free. So obviously these commissioners had every incentive in the world to discover that black people m were indeed slaves when in many, uh, many cases they were free blacks, they were not escaped slaves, they were free blacks that had been living in the country for a very long time. The Fugitive Slave Law, especially because of this, terrified free blacks in the North. Um, even though they had never been slaves, they knew that, you know, they could be, you know, discovered, put into chains, and be brought back south down the river to slavery. They could not testify uh, on their own behalf. They did not have the right to a jury trial, even free blacks. They did not have the right to call witnesses uh, to defend them, that if they wanted support in court, they had to get white friends of theirs to go to court and say, oh yes, I know that black guy, he's not a slave, I'll vouch for him. And if they could get that, they might have a chance um, of not being sold uh, or, you know, returned to slavery, but that's not a particularly free way of going about it. And if you look at the, um, the poster in your notes, um, this poster was posted by abolitionists in Boston, and it's cautioning Boston's black population to avoid talking to police officers and watchmen and, you know, people in town, because they have been empowered to act as slave catchers. Um, and then when these slave catchers rolled into northern communities, abolitionists and a lot of people who were not abolitionists, uh were very bothered by this. They said, who are you to come into our communities and tell, you know, our northern brethren who are slaves and who are not slaves? Many blacks in the north, both born free and escaped slaves, fled to Canada uh, as opposed to trying to deal with this problem. Now, it is one of the glories of American history that in many, many cases, Northerners refused to stand aside when these slave catchers came and um, captured either runaway slaves or free blacks. And a, a smattering of uh, examples would do this, this phenomenon justice. 
Uh, James Hamlet was a runaway that was captured in New York. He was returned south without even having a chance to communicate with his wife and children, just literally snatched off the street, you know, by, um, by, by slave catchers. Um, and brought down south. And this, of course, infuriated the black community in New York. They banded together, along with white abolitionists, and they bought James Hamlet's freedom and brought him back to New York. Euphemia Williams uh, was kind of a, a more disturbing case. Euphemia Williams was a woman who was born in Pennsylvania, black. She had lived in Pennsylvania freely her entire life. Um, her children were born in Pennsylvania. She was seized by slave catchers along with her children and prepared to move back south. Um, luckily for her, a federal judge in Pennsylvania released them back to freedom. William and Ellen Craft were runaways. They had run away from uh, slavery and they were living in Boston. Slave catchers came to catch them, but a Boston mob that same Boston mob from revolutionary days, that Boston mob kind of came out into the streets, defended the crafts, chased the slave catchers through Boston, and forced them uh, to give up without capturing their prey. And then just like in the revolutionary era and other times we have talked about, the Boston authorities refused to arrest the leaders of the mob. The crafts, probably out of a little bit of uh, discretion and wisdom, left the United States, unfortunately, and moved, moved to Canada. And that's, that's something else that's worth talking about here. This is not in the notes. That free blacks in the North, uh, at this time, being forced to flee to Canada and England, removed these talented and industrious people from Northern society, where, you know, if they had been around after the Civil War, they could have aided in race relations, they could have made, you know, joined the Freedmen's Bureau and made it easier for ex-slaves, but, you know, the, the Americans kind of pushed, pushed them out, and it was, it was a, a drain of human capital that, they're, that the United States would have been better off with William and Ellen Craft living in the United States than out of it. Frederick Jenkins was a, um, a slave that was in a Virginia jail for trying to run away, a mob of free blacks uh, broke him out of jail and sent him off to Canada. The most famous case of Northerners refusing to assist in the capture of escaped slaves, and that pissed the Southerners off, by the way, can we just say that? This was the biggest thing that they got from the Compromise of 1850, and now here's the North saying, no, nah, we're not going to help. Southerners said, look, we signed on to things that we didn't like. We admitted California as a free state. We abolished the slave trade in Washington, D.C. We allowed slavery to exist in places that slavery can't really exist. All we got out of this was this fugitive slave law, and you're refusing to follow it. Who do you think you are? Southerners said. The most famous case of Northerners refusing to help these Southerners recapture their slaves is number five, the case of Anthony Burns. In 1854, only four short years after um, the compromise, excuse me, I'm sorry. Only four short years after the compromise of 1850, Anthony Burns, um, the case of Anthony Burns happened. He was an escaped slave who went up to Boston. Uh, and he was arrested there by slave catchers. Massachusetts abolitionists went to court on his behalf, and they filed a lawsuit that said the arrest was illegal. While they are arguing their case in court, a mob forms, breaks into the jail, the guards in the jail did very little to stop them, probably joined the mob. Um, they broke into the jail where Burns was being held. Some of the guards took their duty very seriously, and they fought back. They said, you can't take this person, this is the law, we're going to enforce the law. Uh, and this mob, you know, angry that not all the guards had come over to their side, killed a guard. Um, at that point, the government called in federal marshals, and the mob could not quite get to Anthony Burns uh, to free him. That the mob was fought off by federal marshals. The president of the United States, so, so Anthony Burns remained in prison. But the city of Boston was seething with anger. How dare you 
how dare you send this man back to slavery? This is a, a man, they said. He is not a slave. The President of the United States got involved. President Pierce ordered the Boston authorities to enforce the law at any cost. He sent an entire ship of the Navy to Boston to bring Anthony Burns back. He sent two companies of soldiers and a company of Marines to get Burns and escort him to this naval ship. And they did, in the face of incredible public anger. Boston decked itself out in mourning, draped its buildings in black, people dressed in black. They lined the streets, shouting insults at the soldiers, Look from windows yelled epitaphs down at the people enforcing the law. Finally, Burns was returned to his master, down south. But the cost of returning one single slave to his master because the people of Boston thought it was morally wrong was over $100,000. A few weeks later, a group of abolitionists in Boston made a point and bought Burns' freedom from his master. What this event served to do was radicalize the city of Boston. If you remember back in our talks about the Revolutionary War, when John Adams, the pragmatic moderate, became a radical, when John Adams moved to the side of independence from Britain as a normal, non-radical thing to do, that marked a huge change in who was supporting independence and who was not. This event in Boston in 1854 did something very similar. People who were interested in compromise, people who were interested in being reasonable, people who were interested in kind of being conservative, people who were interested in saying to the South, oh, live and let live, we're different, you know, diversity is a good thing, they said. The South is the South, the North is the North, live and let live. Many of those people were radicalized by this event. They woke up one day and they said, huh? This is slavery in your face. This is slavery here at home. To watch a man go down the street in chains because he happens to be black took a lot of moderate people and turned them into abolitionists. Uh, and it took a lot of conservative civic leader type of people in Boston and it turned them into abolitionists. And then the story spread and the future... The, this happened in towns and cities all over the North. And the sight of these slave catchers chasing slaves through hills and dales and farms and cities led thousands of northerners who had never much thought of slavery before to become anti-slavery. The next big event that divided the sections was a little book, number two, and that book was one of the most famous books in all of American history called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Uncle Tom's Cabin was written by the author Harriet Beecher Stowe. Her father was a famous newspaper editor. Harriet Beecher Stowe, Stowe wrote, wrote this short book that caused an incredible sensation. It's kind of like the Coney video. Everybody was reading this. Everybody was talking about this. And just like the Coney video, there was a whole lot of half-truths and not-truths and Things emphasized wrongly, and things that should have been emphasized were not emphasized. It was a piece of propaganda, and a damn good one. Just like the Coney video. Harriet Beecher Stowe, the book itself, Uncle Tom's Cabin, is not really a well-written book. She's not a very good author. She was not a professional writer. She had no first-hand knowledge of slavery. Her knowledge of slavery came from abolitionist literature, and that's certainly a biased opinion. But she took this abolitionist literature and took this morality and created this morality tale and wrote this book that was successful to an incredible degree. It's not well written, and it's not particularly accurate, but it is full of sympathetic characters that Northerners, you know, kind of identify with. And it was not just a book that made Southerners look evil and awful. Many Southerners in the book are fine and sensitive people. But what made Uncle Tom's Cabin a little different was that it had black characters 
in positive and sympathetic roles. Its main character, Uncle Tom, is a saintly and nearly perfect person who can do no wrong. It's simple, it's easy. The evil overseer, Simon Legree, is the embodiment of evil. And when good and evil clash in a book or on a YouTube video, we obviously want good to win. And then it starts to pull on our heartstrings. The little girl dies. Uncle Tom dies. They literally ascend to heaven where they join the angels. And Northerners ate it up. They passed around copies. Did you read this? Did you read this? Did you read this? Did you know slavery was like this? Remember, this is 1854. People don't travel nearly as much, if at all. Unless you're very wealthy, you are born... You don't go... There's no reason to go down south for most people. Businessmen traveled. The elites traveled. Common people did not travel much. Common northerners had very little first-hand experience of slavery. So when they see a book, the book happens to fit their prejudices, the book, ha book happens to support what they believe, and it becomes truth for them. And they said, can you believe that slavery is like this? Southerners looked at this and said, this is not what slavery is like. Not every overseer is pure, unadulterated evil. Not every slave is perfect and saintly. But it didn't matter to the North. They read the book. They developed their opinions. Hundreds of thousands of copies were sold. Thousands of people became abolitionists on the spot. They have put the book down. I'm anti-slavery. That's a good thing that Harriet Beecher Stowe did. Tens of thousands, while not becoming abolitionists outright, put the book down and kind of said, slavery is that, that, that's not really fair. That's not really just. And if I'm being intellectually kind of consistent here, how do I support democracy and slavery at the same time? It's incompatible. It can't be supported at the same time, really. During the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, who had caused this incredible sensation with his book. And he said to her, he looked at her, and she was a short little woman, and Lincoln was, of course, six feet four. He looked at her and said, so you are the little woman who wrote the book that made this great war. Uncle Tom's Cabin is probably the most politically important book in all of American history because what it did was it made slavery a topic of conversation and it turned, it was warm and con abolitionists were moralistic and religious and reformers and second great awakening people and churchmen and you know as all of us probably know church people can be very moralizing and holier than thou and abolitionists tended to be holier than thou. But Uncle Tom's Cabin wasn't. It portrayed characters that people fell in love with. And it was not preachy. It just let the story and the characters speak for itself. And Uncle Tom's Cabin did more to create abolitionists and more to create anti-slavery feeling in the North than almost anything else. The last major thing, or one of the next major things that divided the sections was Cuba. If you remember the map, the South is running out of new territory to make into slave states. So something grew up called the Young America Movement. And the Young America Movement's goal was to keep Manifest Destiny going, even though the United States had already reached the Pacific. They said, the Pacific is great, but American culture must spread beyond that. Talk was already going on about building a canal across Central America that would link the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. Great Britain and the United States agreed that they could consider building and financing this together. This canal, let's set a map up here. The Americas. There you are. La la la. Cut you 
Whoa. Sorry about this. All right, already in the 1860s, or 1850s, excuse me, there is talk about trying to link up the Atlantic coast of the United States with the Pacific and a canal to be cut somewhere in Central America. So if a canal is going to be cut here in Central America, the islands of the Caribbean become more important to the United States from a strategic point of view. If you have to defend a canal here, what better place to defend it from than Cuba? President Pierce offered Spain, which is now Cuba is a colony, it's a colony of Spain. Um, President Pierce offers $130 million to Spain for the colony of Cuba. Fine. Countries are certainly allowed to make um, offers to buy territory. However, the United States, the, the United States State Department added a little letter along with the request for the territory. The United States State Department, in a fit of expansionary fervor, if you will, suggested that if Spain refused to sell Cuba, that the United States State Department implied that if, if, if Spain failed to sell Cuba, then the United States might consider taking it by force. And this became known as the Ostend Manifesto, O-S-T-E-N-D Manifesto. The idea that if Spain did not want to sell Cuba, the United States might just be forced into taking it by force. Well, it was leaked to the press, and Northerners exploded in anger. They said, this is a Southern plot. All th we don't care about Cuba. All this is is a bunch of Southerners wanting another piece of territory to make new slave states. The Europeans were put off by the brashness of this diplomacy. They looked at the United States and said, I don't know who you are and where you came from and who you think you might be, but this is not how civilized countries behave. And the United States backed down. Talk of annexation of Cuba died down. But it was just another thing that drove the sections apart. Northerners looked at the South and said they will do anything to expand to get more slave states. And the Southerners looked at the North and said, what's the problem? They don't love America. They don't want it to expand. Manifest destiny. The sections were splitting. And the last thing that really kind of that I want to talk about is the Panic of 1857. Democrats controlled the Congress in 1854 and lowered the tariff to levels it had not been since the time of President Jefferson. So the tariff went down, and then in 1857, a normal cyclical downturn took place, a recession, nothing out of the ordinary. But the North, of course, blamed the South. They said, see? You lower the tariff and you see what happens. The economy goes down the tubes because you lowered the tariff. And they said that to the South, you're going to sacrifice the good of the nation for your own interests. You are going to pull the whole United States economy down because you want a lower tariff. Now, the South was not hit hard by the tariff. Uh, excuse me. The South was not hit hard by the recession. They looked at it and said, well, obviously the slave system is better. We've weathered the recession. The slave economy is much better than the free economy. You're suffering through this awful recession. We're not. Our economic system is better. I hope you are getting the sense that by 1857, 1858, these, the two sides of the country have really stopped being able to understand each other. They talk, but the other side does not hear what's being said. And communication is starting to break down. The North and the South are growing 